Hey, Steve Stanek here, the Dusty Caretometer. Today we're talking about uh, 57 Chevy. I rebuilt a 57 Chevy when I uh, just started optometry in 1985. And uh, so today's topic is probably only going to appeal to the uh, automotive enthusiasts. Well, in optometry school, I had this red 1977 Buick Skyhawk. And uh, here in 1984, right after I graduated and went to Fort Carson, I drove it up into uh, Estes Park, Colorado. You see the snow there piled up. I did everything backwards in the year 1984. This was in June. And uh, in, in uh, the first quarter, or the last quarter of the year, uh, the last quarter of optometry school, I went to Hawaii. So I was swimming in the ocean in January, and I was in the snow in June. So a little bit different. But uh, my father always had Buicks like this uh, Buick Regal here. So I always grew up kind of a GM guy. I wanted, I had the idea of rebuilding a 1957 Chevy. Same year I was born. I was always intrigued with the styling, the fins, the tail fins, the uh, aluminum panel on the back. And uh, at Fort Carson, they had a really nice automotive craft shop. But I couldn't do it there because uh, they, but they charged mostly by the hour. They did have a few stalls where you could you could go by the uh, the day but I was going to this was going to take years it it took me 2 3 years to get this car done so uh I couldn't do it there so uh, uh what was uh, kind of different everybody in Colorado was there for the skiing <laughs> and here I wanted to rebuild a Chevy but this was our uh, auto laryngologist uh, at Fort Carson we were co-located with ENT auto laryngology audiology, optometry, and ophthalmology. This was a full bird colonel, Colonel Bauman, and here he is uh, rotating the tires on his El Camino at the auto craft shop. So it wasn't totally without profession, without precedent to have a, uh, a professional person doing uh, car work. <laughs> so anyway, I had a house built for me. I went through the model and picked out what I wanted, and uh, I, I had to live in an apartment for six months because you have to you have to be in the military six months before you can qualify for a VA loan. And with a VA loan, you can buy a house with no money down. You had to pay some closing costs, a few hundred dollars. But uh, like I said, I went through the model home, picked out what I wanted, and then um, got the VA loan. They built it, and they built it in January through like March of 1985. And uh, on my way home from work, I used to swing by there and take pictures. So I, I have photographs of my, uh, my house being built, which is kind of cool. So this was the view right out my front door, front windows. That's Cheyenne Mountain on the left, which uh, contains NORAD. You can kind of see the parking lot up there. And uh, this is what it looked like uh, in the wintertime when it snowed when the sun would go behind Cheyenne Mountain there, the uh, temperature in Colorado Springs would just drop precipitously. And if you, view, if you turned a little to the right, you had a view of Pike's Peak. That's Pike Peak there on the right. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So anyway, I, I bought the house, got the house, and I found this uh, 57 Chevy. Uh, found it through a friend of a friend. I think I paid him $2,500 or $3,500, something like that. And... Uh, Drove it to my house. You can see there's no no houses on either side of me. There's a school behind me. And the car was in pretty bad shape. You can see it covered in dust. And uh, it had a dent there on the left front fender where the uh, lady had hit the uh, previous owner. The previous owner's name was Maurice. And uh, I took the battery out of my uh, Skyhawk and put it in this car to get it to my house. It barely made it there. And uh, interesting vehicle. Now the car you see uh, uh, ahead of my uh, car there is uh, my friend's friend Phil's car in uh, Malibu Classic, I believe it was. And he took the 350 engine out of that vehicle and put in a 400 engine. So I ended up using his 350 small block in my uh, 57 Chevy. And you could see the interior was pretty rough. The previous owner had uh, put some uh, shag carpet in place just to cover up the uh, floorboards. The visor was off. Looking at the engine, he had he'd had an engine fire, so he'd replaced the uh, the uh, battery cables. 
you can see on the right there is the old generator that they used to have. He put a tiny, tiny uh, air filter on there, tiny air filter. And we literally backed it in the garage and started taking it apart. And uh, it came apart a lot more easily than it went back together, I'll tell you that much. So here you see it's really starting to come, come apart. And uh, there you see an engine in the back of my uh, Skyhawk. And I'll tell you, that wasn't the engine that went into my, my 57. I'll explain that later. But here we pretty much got it completely apart. And uh, here's my friend Phil starting to, uh, starting to attack some of the paint and rust. Now this is just to show, <laughs> when you completely take a car apart, it's amazing how many parts you have. And uh, they just go everywhere. I mean, you fill it, rapidly fill up the garage. And then uh, I had some in my uh, family room here. You can see the inner fender. Inner fender is right in front of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, fireplace. See the instrument cluster on top of the mantle. You see the uh, the armrests from the rear seats on the left there, the turquoise color. This was my crawl space. I had the front windshield, the rear side glass, and the uh, the rear seat down there. And here I tipped the frame up against the garage for a while. My garage at that time was uninsulated. I later added insulation. So here we've got it completely apart and the main body is gone. What we did was we sent the body to a dipper. There was a guy in Colorado Springs that would dip cars in acid. He mainly did Model A's and uh, he agreed to do my car and uh, he regretted it later because he couldn't, a Model A he could drop into his tank and, and uh, do it in one, one dipping. But my car he had to constantly reposition it. It was just too big for his tank. So. Uh, he said he was never going to do another 57 Chevy. Now here's Phil prepping the frame. He's trying to get some of the uh, grease and stuff off of it. Here he is. We, uh, we um, rented a welder and he's uh, strengthening up the welds on the frame. And then uh, more welding here. And then uh, he's grinding off the excess uh, welding material. And this is one of the good things about being single. I could just put uh, the parts that would fit in the dishwasher and I ran it through about four or five times and uh, they came out looking almost pristine. So that was cool. And then uh, it's, uh, once the frame was finished, we had it uh, fully painted. You could have eaten off of it. And uh, to save some room in the garage, I temporarily put it in my uh, family room. Uh, Phil helped me carry it in there. And a guy came to my, my house to work on it. I, I don't know, he was a plumber or something. And uh, he said, what's going on here? And I explained what we, what we were doing. And he said to me, it's a good thing you're not married because this would not fly. And I, I could see where he was coming from there. Now I understand that I'm married. <laughs> so here we have the... Um, the fenders, the hood, the rear deck lid. We we just ground the paint, old paint and bondo off those by hand with grind with uh, drills and grinders. And every fender, door, and quarter panel had bodywork done. I mean, at this point, the car was you know what thirty years old, so uh, needed a lot of work. Now the only really severe rust was right behind the front wheels the in the front fenders and you see the uh, the hole on the right there and uh, what Phil did was he um, we cut out the rusty part he welded in some uh, new metal and then we covered it with Bondo sanded it down and um, it turned out great um, that's not really what you do on a show car this was not a show car this was intended to be a driver a hot rod and um, here you see my frame and that orange engine is a different engine we put it in a uh, truck that's a 350 of uh, 350 small block which we dropped into this truck phil was getting paid for this job so we did it over at my house and uh, he collected a little money for that and uh, here's another shot of him dropping it in you see the old block there on the left now the black engine there is my is Phil's old 350 and I painted it black 
one of the instructors at the craft shop said that was probably not a good idea because it makes finding oil leaks more difficult. And on the right you have my uh, fuel tank, which uh, was in good shape, so we just painted it red. And uh, this is when the, uh, the main body came back from the dipper, and it looked like a DeLorean. So all the Bondo and rust and such was removed. I set the shutter speed wrong, and that's why the film is uh, cut off there. So this is the only picture I had, so I use it. But anyway, after that, we started working on the, uh, the body, and we went through gallons and gallons of lacquer. This was, uh, this was the body work. We uh, used Bondo and such. We put it with uh, gray primer, several coats of that, and you see the dust underneath the car from the sanding. Then we hit it with gold. This is uh, candy apple red. This is how you do a candy apple red. Technically, this is a motorcycle color. And then on top of the gold, you put several coats of uh, the clear red, which is where you get the color. Phil was pretty good about most things. He was a great mechanic. He'd painted a lot of cars, but I don't think he'd painted candies before. And so um, that unfortunately came back to haunt us. But uh, Phil was a great mechanic. When we took the engine apart, he put all the bolts into a box, one big box. I would have uh, very carefully labeled and baggied each bolt, but he didn't need to do that. He had done so many engines that he could, um, we had a valve in that box, an old valve, intake valve. And he would claw through the box and, and say, oh, here's the bolt we need, and pull it out. He knew just by looking at him. It was, it was rather remarkable. I called him my crew chief. So I was kind of the, uh, the wallet, and he was the uh, brains of the operation. Um, what was interesting was uh, you, I rapidly learned you needed three things. For this project to move ahead, you needed the parts, and you needed the appropriate tools to install the parts, and you needed the information on how you installed the parts. If, you, if any of those three were missing, the project ground to a halt, and, and there were times when that happened. But uh, here's a picture of me uh, celebrating after we got the, the car pretty much painted. And uh, here's Phil painting one of the fenders. And as I mentioned about the candy, um, one of the problems is when you, um, when you paint a solid color, um, you don't have to worry too much about the color matching as long as you mix the, the paint right or whatever. But with, the, with these candy colors, the more gold you put on over the, the more, I'm sorry, the more color, the more red you put on over the, the gold in our case, uh, the darker it got. So you had to be very careful to compare um, one part of the car to the other. He got one part, one fender way too dark. <laughs> and so um, later on, I had to try to correct that a little bit. Here you see the the body on starting to go on the frame. We uh, put all new uh, rubber bushings, which the uh, the body rests on the frame with, and this is called uh, obviously an off the frame restoration. So here's Phil in front of my engine. We had the headers on there. Uh, those headers we ended up having to take back because they wouldn't fit in the '57 Chevy. We had to get a special set that were. Uh, made for a 57 Chevy, and you can see the reflection coming off that fender back there, which is just great. The problem I had here was Phil got orders for Hawaii, so so he left. So my, my crew chief was gone. I was up, I was on my own suddenly, and uh, so I, I ended up visiting him subsequently in Hawaii, so here he is. But uh, right before he left, the, the last thing he did was he handed me all of his ice scrapers, and uh, he said, I'm not going to need these anymore, <laughs> which I, I told him was very, very cruel because this is what I was dealing with in the, uh, the wintertime in uh, Colorado Springs. You'd see my neighbor across the street uh, who was a uh, artillery. No, he was a uh, he was armor and uh, he'd barely made it home as well. And this is after I spent, I don't know, a half hour shoveling out my driveway, trying to get my car in the garage one afternoon. But... Uh, and then a little bit later, it would look like this as the snow started to melt and such. But uh, what was interesting is uh, at Fort Carson, um, I would have lunch in the, the mess hall, the chow hall, pretty much every day. And uh, on the weekends, of course, everybody went skiing. That's what you did in Colorado Springs. Now, I had been, a, I had been skiing before. I knew what it was about. But I, just, I never went skiing once. The four years I was at Fort Carson, I never went skiing. And uh, 
the conversation would go like this at, at lunch. They would, at, yeah, in the chow hall, they'd be saying, oh, well, we went to Steamboat Springs. Oh, how was Steamboat Springs? Oh, uh, the powder was good, but the lines were long, the lift lines. And then somebody would say, we went to Keystone. Oh, oh, oh good. How was that? You know, somebody else went to Vail. And, and so I, I, uh, <laughs> I was rebuilding a car. So, uh, and that's fine. It was by choice. It's like Lindsey Buckingham said uh, in a documentary about Fleetwood Mac. He said, we are defined by the choices we make. And uh, hey, it was my choice to rebuild a car. But ironically, I could have rebuilt a car anywhere. It, I could have been at Fort Polk or Fort Irwin, which are two of the uh, um, least sought after or uh, most highly uh, avoided uh, um, locations in the Army. But... Uh, I was denying somebody an opportunity to ski at Fort Carson by uh, working on the car. But good news, I had another good friend, uh, Jack here, who uh, stepped in and, and helped me complete this project. It's very, very hard to stay motivated through a project like this. You, you see in, the, in the, well, it used to be in the newspapers. Now I'm sure in Craigslist and whatnot, you'll see advertisements for half-finished project cars where people have lost interest or run out of money and stuff like that. So... Um, here the you know the car progressively got closer and closer together and uh, it started to get exciting. It started looking like something. Um, that let me mention this this front wheel. You see the front silver wheel there. I uh, I converted the car to um, disc brakes on the front, so the 14 inch rims that the car came on wouldn't fit anymore. I had to go to 15 inch rims. So I decided to get these uh, El Camino rims. And I went to a junkyard, and I found an El Camino that had been hit on one side very severely. It had been pushed up onto its uh, opposite side, bending the two uh, rims on the outer side of the uh, collision. So th these two, uh, the two on the inboard side of the, uh, of the accident, appeared good to me. So I bought them, and I had them in my garage for like a year until I needed them. And then when I took them to have the tires installed... They, they wouldn't balance because uh, it didn't occur to me. But think about it. I mean, the huge forces involved with a violent collision like that, what it did, it, it bent the rims side to side so that when they put uh, the tire shop put the, uh, the tires on and put it on the spin balancer, uh, it, it, they just wobbled too much. It, it couldn't be done. So I had to go back to the junkyard and find two new El Camino <laughs> rims. And uh, here you see the... Uh, the disc brakes on the front. That was a kit that came from Classic Chevy Club, which was uh, much more reliable than the uh, easier to service than the the drum brakes that originally came on the, on the front. The uh, I'll say this now: the rear end was a Nova ten bolt limited slip differential. Um, a Nova rear end is the perfect size to fit under a uh, fifty seven Chevy. So the only thing we had to do we had to have the uh, the perches welded on. From the uh, from the old rear end to the new rear end, I don't remember what the gear ratio was. My friend Phil guided me through all that, but it, it fit perfect, and the, the the rear end was it performed really really well. I never had any trouble with that. So this is a little blurry, but uh, let me take you through this. Uh, uh, first of all, on the uh, the rear on the firewall there, you see that half moon shape. That's the uh, original uh, vacuum powered windshield wiper uh, mechanism and so when you uh, were driving when the manifold vacuum decreased your wipers would slow down when it was raining <laughs> so uh, later on I replaced that with an electric motor but uh, you see the uh, Holly went to a Holly four barrel carburetor um, big um, fuel filter Holly uh, intake manifold uh, on the right you see we went to a disc uh, a double dual master cylinder which was nice the old car had a, a single cylinder so if you lost your uh, hydraulic pressure all four brakes wouldn't work you just had your uh, emergency brake but this was nice because the rear and front brakes were independent um, also between the uh, the uh, master cylinder and the uh, uh, vacuum uh, wiper motor you see in this particular case we had two ballast resistors and that's because you can see on the right fender, it's blurry, but there's a super coil mounted there, an Axel super coil. Uh, and it called for our two ballast resistors. We removed the uh, generator and replaced it with a modern AC um, alternator, which is kind of blurry in the, right in the front there. 
And what else? That's about it pretty much here. You see the, the valves exposed there. And I'll, I'll mention something about that in a minute. I wanted to talk about the heads. These are, um, these are pretty much known as uh, Fuley heads. They are basically the gold standard during the 60s, 70s uh, among stock car racers. And what was nice about them is they, they could accept the 2.02 uh, .02 intake valve, which was nice. You get more, uh, it's all about volumetric efficiency. The more uh, air fuel mixture you can get in the cylinders faster, the uh, more power the engine's going to have. And the, sometimes they're referred to as double humper or Dolly Parton heads. And here's the reason why. It's that casting you see right there on the left which uh, you can use your imagination. But uh, I got to pause here because once I got the engine together and I fired it up, I had a big problem. I, I didn't have enough oil pressure. I had about four to six pounds PSI of oil pressure. And um, this is uh, one of the instructors at the uh, Fort Carson auto craft shop at the time. Len was his name. He's uh, posing in front of my Pontiac here, which I brought in for a, uh, a uh, emissions test. But I explained the problem to him, and uh, he knew Phil. He knew Phil real well. We both hung out at the craft shop a lot. And I was just amazed because Len said, uh, you know, there are these three plugs right at the front of the engine. They're right behind the, uh, the um, timing chain cover. And he said, you know, I'll bet you Phil might have left those plugs out or one of them out. And uh, so it was great. I, I went home. Uh, you know, the, the oil pump was brand new, and it didn't make sense that the, the vehicle didn't have any pressure, the engine didn't have any pressure. So I just had to take off the fan, the timing chain cover. Sure enough, Phil had forgotten to put all three of these plugs in, so it was no big deal. I put them in with, uh, with an Allen wrench buttoned up the uh put a new gasket on the uh timing chain cover put the put it all back everything was fine so the next problem i had was um i went to adjust the valves these are hydraulic lifters and one of them i could not get quiet you know you had that tap 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 sound so uh again i went and spoke to lynn and i, I talked to him about it and he said well he said it could be a bad lifter uh, he said, or another thing it could be is we, we'd put a brand new um, camshaft in. And he said, you might have got a defective camshaft. He says, very common. He says, when you first fire up the engine, sometimes it'll round off the lobe, that particular lobe on the, uh, the camshaft. And you will not have, uh, you won't be able to silence that valve. It's not going to, it's never going to close all the way. So, um that would entail completely tearing the engine apart again. So um, we weren't too, I wasn't too thrilled about having to do that. But almost as an afterthought, he said, um, why don't you try replacing the spring? And uh, I put all new springs. All 16 springs were brand new. I used new pistons, new... Uh, new uh, I kept the old push rods. They were all straight, so I didn't change those. But we had new pistons, new rings, of course... Um, but uh, and new lifters, but he said, you know, you might have got a bad spring. So I went to, um, he said, do that first. It's a simple thing to change. So I went to the store. I'll never forget. It was two dollars and twenty cents to buy one spring. And uh, uh, the other problem is you have to when you take the uh, the spring off. If you don't do something with the valve, the valve will just fall back down into the uh, into the cylinder. So I. Um, I bought a device that you put it in the spark plug. You take the spark plug out, put the spark plug uh, adapter in, and it hooks up to your air compressor. So you rotate the engine with a wrench till you're sure that the valves are both closed on that on that piston and then that cylinder. And then you pump up some air in there. And then if you can carefully remove the, uh, the spring with a compression tool and replace the spring. And then uh, I fired up the engine and I adjusted the valve and it silenced the valve. So it was simply a bad spring. It was a new spring, but it wasn't, it wasn't right. So uh, I was really, really lucky. Dodged a bullet there, because otherwise I would have had to completely take the engine apart again, pull it out, and uh, fix everything. 
So the interior was uh, probably the strongest point on the engine. I, uh, I had that done professionally. I bought a kit, aftermarket kit, and um, had it installed. They put new foam in the, uh, in the seats, firmed them up. I put a racing harness in. And uh, here's my other, my friend Jack. I, I took it to a car show. We didn't win any trophies, but if there had been a uh, people's choice, we would have won hands down. It was uh, it was very popular. People were coming up to me all the time. I had this snap-on toolbox that I, I painted uh, candy apple red to match, and I put it in the in the trunk. It took up almost the whole trunk. It was cavernous back there, but um, a lot of fun. Fun car, great to drive. People would come up to you all the time when I'm putting gas in it and talk to me trade stories about their brother who owned one and all that stuff and uh, um, it, it made you feel like you were part of a part of a select group which was uh, which was kind of neat so here's my house this is about the end of my uh, time at Fort Carson my two cars in there and uh, take a look at this look at those junipers those little bushes I, I put them in they were one gallon junipers and this is a picture I got off of um, Zillow of how my house looks today. It's not mine anymore, of course. I uh, I lost money on that on that deal. But now those junipers are way overgrown. And that tree on the right, the aspen tree uh, or uh, birch tree, I um, that was a city tree. They they had a coupon for a free tree you could buy. And when I planted it, it was five feet tall. And now it's of course huge. So it's kind of funny. But uh, this was my garage right before I left. The movers had moved all my stuff, and uh, that's why they. Had, very neat looking garage and these little cubby holes on the wall let me explain I, I I did two years at the old hospital at Fort Carson two years at the new hospital at Fort Carson these these were the cubby holes that were in the eye clinic the optometry clinic and this is where they put glasses when people for various units they had a label for each unit on, on these little cubby holes and when they when they moved out of the old hospital, they were throwing these uh, these shelf units away. And I said, "Hey, can I have them?" And uh, I, I put them in my house. They're very handy for uh, storing stuff on the wall. This was in California. That's my dad on the right there. I was I left my car at the uh, my my boss's house, and then I had to fly back and get the car. And uh, and uh, it was kind of a pain. Then later on, I got smart and I bought a trailer so I could. I could make the move in one, one fell swoop, which was kind of nice. And uh, this is in San Antonio. This is about the time I sold it. I had the car for about 20 years. I had the fuzzy dice on the, the windshield. I had wide tires in the back, wider than the front. And uh, you can see here that the, uh, the paint is fading a little bit. It's almost a candy apple orange instead of a candy apple red. And uh, so I ended up selling the car, which is, eh. It was, uh, it was kind of sad to see it go in some ways, but uh, I took a year of automotives at the University of Maryland in College Park, uh, two semesters in their Department of Industrial Education. So I had formal training in, uh, in automotives. It was kind of neat. The first thing we did, we had a lawnmower engine. We had a partner, two of us worked together, and we had to take this lawnmower. It, it, first you started it and made sure it started. Then you had to take it apart, and you had to measure all the parts with micrometers and whatnot, and then you had to reassemble it, and it had to run. If it didn't, you had to take it apart again and keep doing it until you got it running. And uh, the instructor said, this is basically the same thing. I mean, if you can take a lawnmower engine apart and put it completely back together, your car is pretty much the same thing. It's just there's fewer parts, you know, so... So I kind of had been through this before, and I kind of knew a little bit about it. And I'd worked on my own car. I'd done some things. But uh, I still do. I work. I change my oil. I change my filters. I rotate my tires. But um, modern cars, of course, a little different with all the computerization and such. And uh, another thing, this, this, uh, carbur this car had absolutely no um, anti-pollution controls on it. There was no air pump on it. Um, there was no... EGR valve, exhaust gas recirculation. There was no PCV, which in retrospect was a mistake. It would have been easy to put the PCV valve on and get those um, unspent, unburned gases out of the uh, crankcase. But um, since the body was a 57, it was exempt from all emissions testing. 
and uh, it didn't have catalytic converter on it. It had uh, I put two Sonic Turbo mufflers that went straight out the back. Um, so um, it was it was quick. It got about uh, 12 miles to the gallon in the city, and it got about 15 miles per gallon on the freeway, which wasn't bad for a, for a 350. A few years ago, I was on the Queen Mary 2 doing a transatlantic crossing. And if you look at this picture, the guy in the kind of the middle in the yellow shirt, uh, this was a, 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 a get-together where you talk to the uh, speakers on the ship. And uh, this guy was wearing a Rolls-Royce uh, polo shirt. And so I was speaking to one of the speakers, and uh, the speaker asked this fellow, he said, uh, oh, Rolls-Royce, are you somehow affiliated with them? And the, uh, the fellow in the, in the shirt, his name was Rick, he said, um, I own five of them. So, so the speaker and I were very impressed, and uh, very diplomatically, the speaker asked uh, Rick, what is it you do? <laughs> and Rick looked a little bit embarrassed and laughed, and he said, uh, I'm a retired school teacher, and one of my Rolls Royces actually runs. <laughs> so I knew uh, I knew exactly what he was talking about. It's interesting when a when a car is new, like a, a Rolls Royce, it has great value. But after it gets kind of old and the the maintenance is so expensive, the uh, the value rapidly drops off, and uh, that's certainly the uh, the same situation with the. Uh, classic cars. Now as a financial endeavor, um, this was a really terrible investment, I have to say. Um, it, 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 some people say it's, it, it, figure out it's going to take you like three times as, uh, as long and about three times as much money as you think it's going to take to, uh, to complete a project like this. I think that's, uh, that was probably the, my case. Um, it's a lot easier just to buy a car put together which I did subsequently. I bought this uh, Chevy Impala 95, which um, was a beautiful car. It had the LT1 Corvette engine in it, uh, leather seats. Uh, this was a very fast car. It was frightening. Tim Allen had one of these. He actually modified his to make it even faster, which is, to me, that's like buying a razor blade and trying to make it sharper. But uh, uh, but I actually, there was um, an event at uh, Arlington, Texas, where the plant for this car was was held. Uh, it was called Impala Luza Two, I think. Here we have uh, John Moss, who was uh, General Motors horsepower guru, signing the uh, underside of the uh, trunk lid at the at the rally. It's interesting because uh, basically. There's a parallel between the, the uh, 94, 5, and 6 Chevy Impala. They were basically doing the same thing that I was trying to do with the 57. The car was only made for three years, and uh, they basically took a Caprice and uh, modified it, put a bigger engine in it with uh, some fancy uh, stuff. So It's like uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, Robert Kiyosaki says... Uh, he says an asset is something that puts money in your wallet, which is technically not really true. An asset is something that has value. So in that regard, the 57 Chevy had value, but but Kiyosaki is right. Um, a car is a depreciating asset, and <laughs> you'll find you spend a lot more money than you're going to get out of it. So uh, uh, from an economic perspective, I wouldn't recommend... Wouldn't recommend uh, rebuilding cars. I laugh when I see these shows on TV where people say they're going to make money uh, fixing up cars. I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it can be done, but uh, nine times out of ten, you're, you, it's not going to happen. You're not going to make money. <laughs> but uh, I, I chose to do this instead of golf, which is probably a mistake because uh, the networking I could have done at, uh, by golfing like my father used to do in the military would have probably been a better... Uh, better way to spend my time but uh, but I enjoyed this I've always been kind of a loner a little bit eccentric and uh, so there you go <laughs> anyway hope this helps it's been fun talk to you next time